Good morning, everybody. Um, let's get this right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shirley Parkinans. Welcome. Hmm? Not now. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shirley Parkinans. Welcome to the seventh SIAP seminar. Before introducing our speaker, please allow me to go over some house rules. Please make use of the Q&A box to post questions to the speaker. Questions will be answered after the talk, and there will also be an opportunity to ask live questions after the presentation. Please remain muted for the duration of the presentation, and note that the presentation will be recorded. Today is my pleasure to introduce Professor Rosie Dorrington. She is the Department of Science and Innovation, National Research Foundation, South African Research Chair in Marine Natural Product Research. Originally a virologist at heart, she today showcases a diverse and rich publication record, including peer review articles, books and book chapters, spanning a research career of more than 30 years. Currently, she has developed and spearheads a large transdisciplinary research group centered on marine biodiscovery housed at Roach University. Her current research sees her as principal investigator of several large research platforms. This includes the Antibiotic Accelerator Initiative in Drug Discovery, a collaboration between the South African and United Kingdom Medical Research Councils, supported by the UK Newton Fund. This partnership aims to harness new natural product diversity to combat multi-drug resistance. She also leads the DSI NRF Community of Practice Initiative on developing a marine spatial plan for Algoa Bay, now in its second phase. Other collaborations include that with the UK Global Challenge Research funded One Ocean Hub project in collaboration with the University of Strathclyde the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation funded investigation on how microbes use chemistry, chemistry to form ecosystems in layered living rock in collaboration with Oregon State University. And the National Research Foundation founded African Silicon Ecosystem Program reaches research on deep forests, looking at deep sea cold water corals in collaboration with the South African National Biodiversity Institute. These multidisciplinary research initiatives have led her to collaborate with scientists in the field of marine biology, microbial ecology and genomics, marine natural product chemistry, and antiviral bioassay development. Her association with the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, along with the ASEP Research Platform, provide her research team with access to infrastructure, including the DS I supported shallow marine and coastal research infrastructure research vessels equipped with ROV. This specialized platform allows for the collection of benthic biota at depths of up to 400 meters along the South African coast. This has resulted in the discovery of new invertebrate species that produce novel bioactive marine natural products and they allow for investigation into environmental factors that influence secondary metabolite production. Research collaboration with the South African SIAP, research collaboration with SIAP's aquatic genomic research platform allow for the identification through mega genomic analysis, the biosynthetic pathway selected for selected marine natural products in invertebrate associated microbiomes. Professor Rosie Dorrington actively contributed contribute in our fight against the COVID-19 epidemic and consults the Roach University Coronavirus Response Team and serves on the Eastern Cape Provincial Joint Team Task Team to best inform on response strategies. Be sure to catch her straight talk with Professor Dorrington, an informative report series addressing common concerns regarding COVID and vaccination. Professor Rosie Dorrington is above all passionate about teaching and nurturing young developing minds and her involvement in the Department of Science and Innovation Seamester Cruises aboard the SA Agalas is where she introduces microbial life in the sea to young researchers. 
through hands-on experience and lectures on the potential of discovering new and useful compounds associated with marine invertebrates like sponges. But today, she will tell us a bit more on her work she is doing in harnessing the metabolic potential of indigenous marine biodiversity, which aim to develop a multidisciplinary duck discovery pipeline, which will focus on the biodiversity of natural marine products from sponges to the isolation of bioactive compounds and the identification of the microbes that produce them. So without further delay, let's hear from Rosie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you um, to Syed for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about the research that we're doing here at Rhodes University. Um, I just want to share my slideshow. And come on, you. That's the thing about the pandemic, isn't it? We've started talking to our computers as though they are family members. Um, especially when they won't listen to us. Right, so um, let me just organize my screen here. Right, so um, I want to give you um, some, some uh, well, a cook's tour, I guess, through um, the discovery platform that we, we have been building over the last um, five or six years um, in, in, um, at Rhodes University in collaborations, particularly with our colleagues at SIA and also at Scion in Port Elizabeth, um, and how we can use that to develop a drug discovery a, a, um, drug discovery platform um, in the Eastern Cape. And in particular, I'm going to talk about um, our marine natural products discovery work. So um, let me just move some of these things around. Right, so before we get too excited about the potential for producing new compounds and making a lot of money out of royalties, let me give you an idea of how long it takes and how much it costs. So this is the average drug discovery um, pathway. Um, you have a number of phases. The first phase is really the discovery phase, which can take about six to six and a half years. And that's then followed by clinical trials. So you start with 10,000 compounds, in the discovery phase, and then in preclinical, you narrow that down to 250 compounds for preclinical studies. From there, it's likely that only five compounds make it out of the, the set. And of those, probably only one will eventually go at the end of clinical trials um, to um, an FDA re review. So that's the Food and Drug Administration in the US. In the case of South Africa, it would be SAPRA. And at the end of that process, which takes um, a year and a half or so, you will finally get into um, the pharmacy and be able to start making a return on investment. The problem is that the, the, the bulk of the, of the discovery phase, um, the cost of that is probably in the tens of millions of dollars. This is US dollars, millions. Um, by the end of the preclinical phase, you probably have spent about 100 million, but the clinical trials can take anything, um, can take the final cost up to about a billion dollars, a billion dollars times 15 at the current exchange rate. Um, and that is the amount of money it takes on average to get a drug into the pharmacy. And so it's, it's really not surprising that pharmaceutical companies um, produce drugs for people who can afford them. They're going to have to recover a, more than a billion dollars worth of investment before they can actually start making a profit on those compounds. Right, so we are playing in the front end of the discovery process, um, and I'm going to unpack this now and to, to give you an idea of the platform that we're building here in the Eastern Cape. So before I do that, um, this is probably South Africa's best known marine natural product. It's a compound called kephalodiscum. I always say it looks a bit like chicken wire. Sorry, kephalostatin. It's made, it was originally isolated from a tubeworm called um, Cephalodiscus gilchristi, but it's also found in tunicates, tunicate species of um, the Australian coast, a related compound. It's probably the most cytotoxic compound that's ever been tested by the, the National Cancer Institute. Translated, that means it's one of the most active anti-cancer compounds I've ever tested. And it works against um, cancers that are generally quite recalcitrant to chemo to, to um, 
chemotherapy. In particular, what makes this compound really important is it targets a part of the cancer pathway that is not present in normal cells. And so the cytotoxic effect, which is often a problem with chemotherapy, is very low. So this is a really serious anti-cancer drug, but it never got past um, clinical phase one clinical trials. And the reason for that is because the problem of supply. So this is a complicated compound. They originally dredged 450 kilograms of tube worms off the agullis bank. And from that, they were able to isolate 100 milligrams of um, cephalostatin one and 20 milligrams of the other active compound, cephalostatin seven. And that was only enough to get through phase one clinical trials. And after that, the, the further development of this com these compounds as anti-cancer drugs is stopped. So the problem of supply is a big roadblock for this. And it's universal for other marine natural products, um, compounds where really you have a number of options in the old days, 20 years ago, the way to go about it was to harvest the biomass from the field, the sea, um, and attempt to um, find a sustainable supply of compounds that can get you through clinical trials. Um, the alternative is to try aquaculture, but that's really difficult with tube worms and sponges and, and tunicates. The alternative, which is, has generally been the case, is to synthesize the compounds in a chemistry lab. But you can, you can imagine that a compound that is this complicated is difficult to synthesize, and, the problem, and there are lots of problems with producing sufficient quantities, which makes, even if this compound was synthesizable in the lab, it would be very expensive to use. So if you're lucky, and it happens quite a lot, um, these compounds um, are produced by microbes, bacteria and fungi, mostly bacteria. And if you're able to culture the, the compound, you could potentially set up for the compound um, to grow in the lab. And then you make large fermenters and you isolate the compound from lab cultures. The alternative is you can clone the genes that are that encode the enzymes that make the compound. We call that the biosynthetic gene cluster. And you can put it into an organism that works really well in the lab, like Escherichia coli, one of our gut bacteria, or other lab um, isolates. Or, and this is the, the alternative that is most often thought to be the, the best, is to use a combination of some, uh, chemical synthesis and bacterial um, enzymes and cells to produce the compound. But the second half, of the process is difficult and it takes time. And it, it has increased the discovery time for finding, um, using new natural products. Right, so in, in our research platform, we have, and, and I'm speaking now specifically for the anti, antimicrobial drug discovery program. Um, we have four main objectives. The first is to um, map the macrofauna diversity in the Agullis bioregion, which is particularly rich. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, to assemble a taxonomically identified and curated collection of ascidians um, and, and um, sponges and other invertebrates. Um, and this collection is housed at SIAB and at the Eziko Museum in Cape Town. Importantly, to generate chemical extracts from these specimens and to screen them for um, antimicrobial, that's antibacterial, antiviral, and anti-cancer activity. And our main focus at the moment is antibacterial, focusing on um, bacterial pathogens that are drug resistant, known as the escape pathogens, um, Klebsiella pneumonia, Staph aureus, you've probably heard of, um, and Enterococcus, etc which are drug resistant bacteria that are particularly important in um, multi-drug resistant infections in hospitals. And then finally, when we have extracts, identify the, the compound and explore its potential in um, the development of new um, antibiotic drugs. So this is the marine biodiscovery pathway um, by pipeline that we, we're active in and we're active in at, at all areas along this pipeline. And I'm going to highlight some of these further on to give you an idea of the kind of work that we're doing. So right up in the beginning, we're mapping the habitat and the biodiversity there. And this includes um, the macrofauna as well as their associated microbes. And in concert, um, looking at the environment around the system and how it functions is directly to, um, impacts 
the um, health of the habitat and the, the macrofauna and also impacts their ability to produce the compounds we're interested in. And I'll give you some evidence as to how that works. Clearly the field collections and there we're absolutely dependent on the ASEP infrastructure, particularly um, it, uh, the, the previous um, ship, the Kovalada, and then the new observer and her team. Um, and then to, to then establish a collection of invertebrates, um, a specimen collection that's been curated and identified. And at the same time, we're also assembling microbial culture collections because those um, microbes that can be cultured or really give us a shortcut in terms of producing the compounds we're interested in. Um, from there, we're looking at chemical extracts, as I, as I, as I mentioned, um, um, screening for activity. And once we have active extracts to isolate and characterize the active compounds. Um, and, and once we know what they are, we can have, and we can begin to work on their targets um, in, in the bacterial cells. And here it's really important if you're looking for antibiotics is you want the, the compounds to target the bacteria, but you don't want um, off targets in the host, e.g. ourselves, because you need to um, selectively target the bacteria and not the, the host itself. So anything that is cytotoxic, i.e. it's also toxic against mammals and mammalian cells is automatically we've um, moved out or discarded from the program. At the bottom here, we're also interested in understanding how these compounds are made um, by their hosts and if they are, um, and to use that information to begin to um, develop processes to produce the compounds in larger quantities so that they can be progressed in, um, as leads and eventually go into preclinical trials. So this is just a summary of where we're active. Um, in the field. So most of our work is, is conducted along the east coast of South Africa. Um, we have um, specimen collections um, from, um, in fact, we have an old collection that was generated by Mike Davies Coleman that comes from Pemba in um, actually Punta del Este in Mozambique. Um, we, we're active at the moment in collaboration with Kerry Singh from Sanbi um, in a project of um, St. Lucia. And then the, um, the um, Annabelle Shoal, just south of Durban. And then we're also active at sites, um, coastal sites off um, the Eastern Cape, off East London, Algoa Bay and Cape St. Francis. So this big red line here indicates the Gunners current that flows along our East Coast <coughs> and then retroflects um, somewhere around the, over the Agalas Bank. And the, the, it is, the, 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 the combination of the Agullis current and the um, upwellings along the east, east coast that create an environment that is particularly conducive to um, a large diversity of species. And in, in, in some cases, the species, if the same species when found at different places along the coast produces different natural products, which is really interesting. So I'm going to talk about a project that we're doing at the front end, which is um, <coughs> um, mapping um, the habitats and looking at how the ecosystems function. And it's a project that's been done opportunistically in collab um, as a result of the Seamester cruise. Um, it's um, Ros, I'm going to talk about Rosalind Gibbs PhD project and its collaboration with Tommy Senior on an Ant Antarctic cruise on the um, infamous Treshnikov vessel. So we were able to participate in two semester cruises um, that are used, and, and the purpose of the semester cruise is to, um, and I think I've got the wrong one here, is to um, sample across the Agalas current, in particular off Hamburg. Um, this is a separate cruise that, that is the crossroads cruise that goes from Marion Island, which is somewhere down here, and then um, comes up to land across the Agalas bank close to Mossel Bay. And the purpose of this is to develop an understanding of the Agalas current, um, because the current has a very large influence on our, on our study sites. And what Ros has developed is molecular barcoding techniques for working with um, particularly the phytoplankton. She's interested in primary productivity. And so here is um, some of her data. So these, um, this is a barcode for um, the um, diatoms and um, 
that, that's based on chloroplasts. So it picks up cyanobacteria and it also um, picks up the um, diatoms and um, dinoflagellates. And what we can see from this is that um, in subsequent cruises across, I'm losing my mouse here. There we go. Um, in subsequent cruises, the, the pink and the red dots across the Agunas current, um, you pick up the same types of um, phytoplankton that they seem to be really conserved. So if you look at the red, um, if you look at the pink dots and the red dots here, um, the blue dots, the blue, the blue um, samples here, were collected along the coast um, in 2018 on the outward um, cruise, which was from Cape Town to Hamburg. And then again, on the way back, which are the dark blue ones from Hamburg back to Cape Town. And there is a significant difference in the microbiota um, that we encountered within a week, the week of sailing from Cape Town up to Hamburg in the one direction and back from Hamburg to Cape Town. And we wanted to know um, what were the environmental factors that probably that, that caused us. And Ross has been able to show, looking at the temperature um, measured for the crews um, in the underway system and also um, chlorophyll A concentrations, that um, the conditions for the, the outward and homeward crews were different. You can see that it was much colder on the way back. Um, there was a large chlorophyll bloom. And the thermistor data that collected from um, monitoring sites um, off Algoa Bay suggests that um, there was an, up, an, an upwelling in the time between when the cruise, um, the outward cruise and the return cruise. And we were able to capture the changes in the biodiversity directly as a response to the upwelling conditions. So this metabar coding um, technique and looking at the phytoplankton we think is a really sensitive method to look at the response of primary pro producers um, in, in short time to changes in, um, oceanographic to changes in the ocean, oceanographic features along the coastline and those are really important so we've also been Ros has also been working in Algoa Bay and this is part of the community of practice project and she's been working um, to look at how the environmental fact, how the phytoplankton communities change over a long period of time. Um, she collected samples on a monthly basis known fondly as the phytoplankton run by Siren um, from three stations that we felt were representative, Cape Receive, Bird Island, and St. Croix. So Cape Receive is out here. This is Bird Island here, and St. Croix is off the Kucha, the Kucha system here. Um, from February 29, uh, 2018 to, fe to February 2019, we used metabarcoding and we've actually characterized the bacteria by 16S RNA sequencing and the phytoplankton by 18S RNA, which is on the chromosome, and then the Rubisco gene, which is on the, um, which focuses. So this will pick up all the micro um, plankton, whereas the Rubisco gene picks up the chloroplast. So you're looking at diatoms and or photosynthetic organisms. And then on the right here, you can see um, an analysis of the uh, phytoplankton, that's um, the Rubisco genes. And what, what's really interesting is that the phytoplankton communities are, um, are, are clustered irrespective of whether they are out on the coast or in the in interior of the bay or at Bird Island, the site is, is not an issue. What seems to be that the big driver is the season. So this is the second half, I think. Um, the, the, the samples are split between the winter and the summer season. And when you plot the, the drivers, potential drivers of, the, um, of that diversity, it becomes very clear that the main driver is the wind direction. Um, so whether you have at, um, predominantly easterlies or westerlies, determines whether or not there are upwellings across the bay. And if there are upwellings, wind-driven upwellings, you get phytoplankton blooms, uh, particular diatoms, which are um, give you primary productivity that then feeds into the rest of the trophic layers in the bay. But if the wind changes um, and you get more turbidity, you're going to favor dinoflagellates and harmful algal blooms. So Tommy Bornman and I, and I are really, and Shirley are really excited about this data because not only do the microbes um, show this, but um, as you go up the trophic layers, including the, the zooplankton, 
um, and the other macrofauna, um, it appears that all of these can be linked back to these same factors. And now we finally have a, a handle on what the driving factors are in Olgo Bay. And this is not good news because as the climate changes, the wind systems are going to change. We're going to have fewer cold fronts and the bay, the bay is likely to become less productive. Right, so I'm going to switch gears now, just keeping an eye on the time, um, and talk to you um, briefly about our field collections um, and assembling um, uh, culture collection, uh, well, collections of, of um, invertebrates, tunicates, and then also microbes. And I'm just going to briefly fo focus on. So this is um, a collection that we did in um, March and April of this year. And it's my favorite collage because it's really colorful and there's some really interesting new um, species here. And we collect by ROV um, and the, the, the specimens immediately go across to Shirley, is particularly if we're interested in them, where she will do um, the morphological identification and coupled with um, molecular identification. And we've more often than not, Shelley, here's a picture of Shelley on the, the Observer during one of our cruises. We, we are discovering an inordinate number of new novel species. So this is a publication, um, Shelley's publication from 2019. We discovered two new members of the family, uh, um, of the Tranquilidae family, in particular the genus um, Titsikama, and I'll talk a bit more about them later. These are our pet sponges. Um, but this is a um, out of the, the 20 sponges that Shelley identified for us from the March cruise. 16 of them are potentially novel. So the novelty, the potential novelty of the biota um, at, in the 30 to 60 or 70 meter rocky reefs um, in Algoa Bay is very high. And with novel um, macrofauna species comes a potential for producing new compounds. So back to the um, biodiscovery pipeline. And now I'm going to move on to talk about the, um, I'm actually not going to talk about the, well, I'm going to talk about the chemical extracts, which is the next part of the process. So um, we, we then take small biopsies and we now have the technology to be able to um, use less than a, a, a gram of the, the material um, in, in, to, to do preliminary um, chemical extracts. And if, in this case, this particular sponge, which is um, a Tsitsikama Michaeli from the previous one, as opposed to Pedunculata, gives you a different extract. I'll get back to why that's interesting. We then assay them for um, bioactivity, and here you can see the red lines are E. coli, the blue lines are Staph aureus, and you can see that some of the extracts are active against E. coli, and some of the others are active against E. coli and um, Staph aureus. And then we use mass spectrometry. So um, this is a, a, a technique that allows you to identify the mass of, of multiple compounds in a chemical extract. And we can use that those masses and the um, this, um, spectra to identify the compounds. And then we can use bioinformatics, molecular networking, to group those compounds into families of compounds that allows us to find potentially novel compounds in our extracts. Okay, come on you. All right. We also do a lot of microbial profiling. We're interested in knowing which microbes are associated with these um, um, isolates. Come on you. And I'm quickly going to go through um, how we do the microbial profiling. So for those of you who are not molecular biologists, here is a schematic. You, you isolate all the DNA from all the microbes. You use PCR to amplify um, the barcoding regions. So this is now a library of, um, in this case, 16S or ribosomal RNA um, genes. And what you can do with that then is to use, you can identify, use those genes by searching a database to identify what, where the genes come from. Um, you, can, you can analyze those and compare the isolation of these, these, gene, these microbes in different bacteria, I'm sorry, in different hosts. So this is a, a project done by Sam Waterworth on a sponge called Tetia, um, Tetia rubra. 
um, that we collected from two reefs in, in Algoa Bay, Evans Peak and Brybanks Reef. Um, these tethias produce, um, the, you can see the, the larvae, uh, they look like eggs. And we're able to show us so each of these color bars is a particular um, bacterium species. And we're able to show that the parent sponge um, transfers um, its bacteria. So let's look at this green guy, here are the eggs. The parent sponge actually transfers its bacteria, its um, associated bacteria to its offspring. So here are the pink guys. And interestingly, um, we were able to show that the bacteria that are harbored by the sponges isolated at Evans Peak are different to the bacteria that um, are present in, associated with Tethia rubra sponges collected at Rybanks Reef. And we now know that the chemistry that produces second metamolites is also different. And I'll come back to this. So added to this, now I'm going to add another layer, and Shirley mentioned that we also use genomic techniques to identify um, um, the genomes of the organisms without culturing them. We can use um, sequencing and then bioinformatics to identify the genomes and down the line, the way in which they potentially produce the compounds we're interested in. And the way the metagenomics works, here you have your... Um, my hair in the morning chromosome extraction, the chromosomes, they get broken up into short fragments. And then we use next generation sequencing similar to the facility that's available um, at, at SIAB in, in the um, aquatic genomics um, research platform. And we're then able to generate what we call shotgun sequencing. And that shotgun sequence, those sequences are uh, assembled by computer. You need very big computing power and through a collaboration with SIAB, we've established the Agrip server, which has two terabytes of RAM, which is what it needs to be able to put all these samples, these sequences together, and it assembles them into what we call contigs, contiguous sequences by overlapping them. And then uh, you can take those overlap sequences and sort them into what we call bins, and each bin represents the genome of the, of the organism that they came from. And I'm not going to go into the details, but each of these little blips here represents a group of sequences from an original, an original um, chromosome that was isolated from a bacterium that was in the environment that we're working in. Right, so how do we do this, and how can we use this to um, find new compounds? So I'm going to introduce you to Shirley and my favorite group of sponges, the trunculates. Um, it's a family of cold water sponges that have found anything from 20 to 700 meters deep, um, generally in the Southern Hemisphere, and they're very abundant in Algoa Bay. They produce compounds called pyrolaminoquinones. So these are alkaloids that have anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, um, anti and antimicrobial activity. And we're, we're interested in these compounds because they're quite varied and we have access to a number of species. So here are the compounds. Not only are they produced um, by our sponges, but they're also produced um, by bacteria, um, and they're also produced by tunicates. So the, uh, the thinking is that the, our sponges may be harboring a bacterium that is producing these compounds, and that they, uh, um, because the, our compounds are related to compounds that are produced by bacteria, the guys in the green. So we're active in Algoa Bay across um, a number of different sites, in particular um, the St. Croix, Croix complex, which is Evans Peak Reef, uh, Brenton and um, St. Croix. Right. And then out in the bay, um, we've been um, collecting at um, Bellboy, which is a shallow reef just off um, the coast in the bay, and then also in um, Thunderbolt Reef. Where has my mouse gone? Thunderbolt Reef, and then a dry banks, which is more out to sea. Um, and here is a collection of um, latrunculate sp uh, sponges uh, belonging to the Tsitsikama um, species that we've been able to access from collections here and also off East London. So what the first thing we did was have a look at the bacteria. And what's really interesting is the trunculate sponges all are all associated with very high, with a very highly conserved genome. Uh, uh, 
microbiome. So the microbes that live in these sponges are very are highly conserved. And what you're looking at here for T. famis is sponges collected from between 2014 and uh, 2018. And the big yellow bar here is a, a specific type of, of um, bacterium that I'll get to just now. But you can see that there is a very high, the, the, irrespective of which year and where they were collected, the, the, the patterns of the bars look very similar. Here is another set of closely related sponges called uh, Titicama nguni and Pedunculata. Um, they have very similar um, um, bacteria to the, the fabuses. And then also um, Michaeli and a number of, um, and some sponges that belong to um, other, other genera. This is an interesting one. Uh, the Latrinculia apicalis was collected off Puva Island, which is in the South Atlantic and 1500 kilometers southwest of us. And they still contain the same bacteria. So this yellow guy is really interesting. Um, it's a representative of a whole new um, family of bacteria. We did the metagenomics thing and we discovered that there, this is a new order of bacteria called the Teti bacteriales. Um, we've identified three families of which ours is in the Percy bacterial family by looking at the genomes. And what, what's really interesting is that these bacteria um, appear to have been acquired by their hosts. If you, if you look at these yellow guys, they spread across a number of different sponges that are not related to each other, closely related. Similarly, the Perseids are, are spread across different sponge families. And so we think that sponges are acquiring on an ongoing basis these symbionts when they need them, and that once the, the symbiont finds a niche and a reason for being in the sponge, it then adapts and begins to become a an obligate symbiont of the sponge. And we are proposing the name for the um, Titicama famous um, Titi bacteriales family um, uh, species that we've identified. We, we're proposing that it should be called Aquabalana africanus, Aquabalana, which means to share. And we believe that Afri uh, these African sponges are sharing their bacteria with other sponges around the world. Right. So that briefly, I just want to talk about the problem of supply. Um, so we talked about the, the, different re the different ways in which you can, you can identify, um, you, can, you can make more of these compounds. And we've been working to look to see if there's ways in which we can um, identify the biosynthetic pathway of the uh, prolaminoquinones in our truncated sponges and find um, biological ways of making the compounds. So this is Jan Kalinski's work for his PhD. He's a chemist and he developed our um, mass spectrometry work. And during the course of collecting um, sponges, because we're now able to work with such small samples, you can see there's a sample of less than a gram of biomass. Um, this is a collection of five out of a, a collection of 20 sponges, all collected from the same location in Evans Peak. And when we made the, the, the extracts, we, we noticed that the majority of, of the sponges give you this dark brown, green colored extract, but some of them, and specifically this one, give you a different colored extract. And we sent the sponges to Shirley and said, please, can you check to see if we've actually maybe misidentified them? It turns out they're all Titicama favis, both genetically, and also the spicules are Titicama favis, but interestingly, the sponges that produce the um, different chemical extract have a, a high percentage of misformed spicules. So um, you're looking at the bottom guy here, that the spicules are misformed. So there's something going on in the sponge that makes a different compound, and we wanted to know, know more about it. So Yama did chemical extracts, and he characterized them by mass spectrometry, and he found the pink guys, which we call chemotype 2, yeah, produce um, only a small set of the potential compounds that can be produced. So Titicama famous normally produces a, a broad array, which includes macaluvamines, uh, discarabdins, and Titicama means, but the pink guy produces only macaluvamines. And when you look at the proposed chemical pathway, um, it looks as though the production of these compounds is blocked at an early stage in the pathway. What Yama also observed was that the amino acid phenylalanine appeared to be up, 
um, more abundant in the chemotype 2, the guys that produce just this. And we know that phen phenylalanine is an important precursor in the conversion of macrolumines into the more complex proaminoquinones. So we hypothesize that in this particular sponge, this process has been blocked or is being inhibited. So this, we then expanded, um, Yama has been working, um, he's identified more than 200 different compounds in 10 species of the trunculates that we've been working on. And we discovered that there is a second chemotype, and this time it's um, Tsitsikama mycali, which is one of Shirley's new um, novel species. And there's a chemotype here that produces, also, that also seems to be blocked in early stage. Here's the chemotype, the off type, and here is the normal, the, the chemotype one, this is what we would expect, there are Tsitsikama means. So they, now we have two species of latrunculates that both have a chemotype that is blocked um, at this point. And when you, when you um, analyze those compounds, you can see that this is the normal family of compounds produced by these two species and others, but the chemotypes that, um, but the two chemotypes produce completely different um, families of compounds. So the question is, what are they doing? So we, we decided, we think that there's a microbial, um, there's a microbial effect and we wanted to know more. So we went back and analyzed the microbial communities of all the sponges we had. And these black stars indicate um, sponges that produce chemotype two and the unstarred ones produce the normal chemotypes. And we were incredibly excited to discover that there are there is a, a pattern that we observed that the um, starred sponges that produce chemotype two have an unusually high proportion of um, a spirochete bacterium, um, both in Tsitsikama favus and also in um, um, Tsitsikama mycali. And we hypothesize that these that this particular um, sp um, spe species, which we call SPOD 2 15, may be involved either in responding to an unfavorable environment or it may actually be causing the unfavorable environment. And so we are now proposing to call this. Um, this new species, candidate species Latrunculus, which is the, the, the host sponge, um, which means troublemaker, because we think it's, it's affecting the, the health of the sponge and the compounds that are produced. So you might ask, is this the, 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 the species? Unfortunately, sadly, we don't think this is a species that produces prolominoquinones, but we think, we think we have a handle on that. And here's something really interesting. Both of the species of sponges, Tsitsikama fabus and Tsitsikama polunculata, um, that produce the chemotypes with the unusual chemistry are found at Evans Peak and nowhere else. We've collected sponges from Rybanks, um, Thunderbolt, and all along the coast, and even Brenton. Um, but the, we only seem to find these um, optype chemotypes at Evans Peak. So it's tempting to speculate that um, there's something going on at Evans Peak. Um, Evans Peak is where a lot of the harmful algal blooms are found, um, increasingly numbers of harmful algal blooms. It's off the Kucha port. There's a lot of bunkering happening here. And it's possible that there is environmental impact from the ships that are parked in this area. Or it may be something completely different, but it does mean that the, the, the habitat around um, Evans Peak is driving the sponges to produce and their microbes to produce new chemistry. And we're interested to know what that is. It's, it's an, an, a handle on the ecosystem health, but it's also potentially going to give us access to new compounds that we wouldn't normally see in our sponge metabolomes. Right, and this is just to, to say, we actually think we've found um, the bacterium that produces proaminoquinones. Um, this is a, a library of sequences, and each of these colors is a bin. And the one that's been circled with that little red dot on, that red dot is um, a DNA sequence that encodes a pathway that we think is responsible, based on the bioinformatic analysis, for producing um, a proaminoquinone that is closely related to macaluni. When you look at this, the chromosome of this organism, and you, you compare it with other chromosomes, um, that are available in the database, 
It's been identified as a planktomycete, which is a ubiquitous marine phylum called Ruby pyrolella and Ruby pyrolella um, tenax. And the really two really exciting things we found um, um, signals for this particular um, organism in other sponge species that produce um, Paralamina quinones. But really exciting is that there is a culture of this particular bacterium that has been um, um, isolated by a group in um, Germany that can grow in the lab. And we now know from the genome sequence that this or a similar pathway is present on that, that organism. And it gives us hope that we're going to be able to culture this particular bacterium or that we can produce potentially macalumine from the, uh, the isolate that was isolated in Germany. So this is a really interesting, um, what we're discovering is that none, that our platform is a set of interrelated systems. And the work that we're doing on the metabolites is now feeding back into them, um, giving us information on the environment that we're working in and the habitat that our organisms find themselves in. Okay. And you're only as good as the people that you work with. Um, I've highlighted those who worked on the projects, um, but this is um, the current members of my group. Um, I couldn't do it without them and their enthusiasm. Um, it, we work at sometimes under tough conditions, particularly if you get very seasick and you have to go out and do field work. Um, and it's been very difficult in the last couple of years with people and uh, with um, us being physically isolated from each other. Um, but I'm very proud of my research group and the, the, the way in which they work together. We're funded by a large number of different people. Um, in particular, um, I need to acknowledge ASEP, Sion, and um, Syab, who are the main partners in the work that we're doing on the Marine Natural Products Fund. Um, the Antarctic Circumnavigation Expedition, um, from which Sam Waterworth was able to collect some sponges that we're working on. Um, and then funding from the Department of Health and um, the Newton Fund um, and the Medical Research Council of the UK and South Africa that are funding the antimicrobial work, Departments of um, Science and Technology, Science and Innovation that fund my research chair and the NRF that funds our community of practice. I'm happy to ask some questions, uh, to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, thank you for a very comprehensive and well-delivered presentation. Um, please, will, can I remind all of those that would like to ask a question to please raise your hand if you want to ask a question in the live now. In the meanwhile, we have a question from Ryan Daniels. He asks, um, when a compound is found to be not promising for cancer, what do you do with it next? Do you drop it or move on? Or is there some other useful function that it could be used for? So that's a good question. And my chemists will say every compound is interesting, whether it has, a, um, whether it's potentially not going to progress. Um, those compounds that we progress clearly we have to um, protect in terms of the intellectual property. So the compounds that don't make it through the pipeline often will end up in um, publications. Um, and also they then add to the knowledge of um, the chemistry of what these organisms are producing. And you never know, you only discover the activity that you're looking for. Um, and so we're, we're developing a, a library of extracts and compounds and constantly rescreening them because as new assays come up, we may find that they have activities that are really interesting. And here's an important thing. These, these organisms do not produce chemistry for nothing. It takes a lot of energy. Um, and the beauty of marine natural products is that the, the host organism produces them for a function and that function is invariably biological. And so just because we don't pick up um, an activity currently in our screens, it's very likely that we could pick up activities down the road. So no, no, no compound gets thrown out. It gets put in the library and we go back to it later. Thank you, Rosie. Rosie. Then we have one from Penny, Penny Halfworth. Thank you for a fascinating talk, Rosie. In response to your mention that it's likely our go away will experience fewer cold fronts in future and become less productive as a result. 
as a non-scientist or specialist or as a non-scientist, my immediate thought was to wonder whether it is possible to say what the knock-on effect or effects are for adjacent inland areas of fewer cold fronts in the bay might be, for fewer. I think she means for fewer cold fronts in the bay might be. I am not a cli climate scientist. Tommy Bornman is much be would be much um, better to answer that question, but it's, all is not lost. I think we need to be able to predict what's going to happen. And then we need to look at other, because climate is not the only impact on the bay. And one of the reasons we're seeing um, a lot of um, um, harmful algal blooms, et cetera, is because there are other environmental impacts, most of which are anthropogenic. So the Swartkops River is also in that area. It's introducing a large amount of um, anthropogenic pollutants, including um, sewage and uh, industrial waste. Um, the bunkering is also um, potentially ha um, harming that particular environment. Um, and so we need to find ways of reducing other impacts um, and also identifying um, sites which are less, less impacted and ensuring that they are protected from, um, and, and that they will potentially be able to buffer against these effects. Um, and and it, it's worth, um, you may want to attend the stakeholder meeting for the community of practice um, later next week. Um, have a look at um, the website of the Algoa Bay project which is working to develop a, a marine spatial plan for the bay and also to find ways of mitigating some of these harmful impacts. It's not, all is not lost. We need, but we need to know what we should, we can expect so that we can work around that. Thank you, Rosie. Good question. We have, <laughs> we have another question from Ryan. After the buyer prospecting, who takes on the work of clinical tri trials? Does that happen in, this, in South Africa? And then a second follow-up is, is there cancer in those organisms? I'm not sure what he mean, means there, but yeah. yeah, let's do the first one. Does clinical trials happen in South Africa? Yes, as it turns out, South Africa has a very well-developed clinical trial um, infrastructure, particularly because we've been the focus of um, anti-HIV and um, anti-TB drug development. So we have a good clinical trial infrastructure. Um, so we often are the site for clinical trials, but these kinds of clinical trials would have to be done by um, multinational organizations, not always pharmaceutical companies, the World Health Organization will invest as well. And then um, NGOs like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have also been, and Met Sans Frontiers, um, MSF, have also been involved in clinical trials. Um, it is a massive undertaking, and you need to be sure that the compounds that you're progressing are going to have a good chance of getting through the clinical trial. Backing up to, is there cancer in these organisms? So why do these organisms, why do the sponges have these compounds? Well, sponges and acidians sit on a rocky floor. They can't move around. They're like plants. They have to defend themselves against predation. And one of the ways that they do that is to produce really toxic compounds. Um, and these toxic compounds are um, targeted against predators, but they're also targeted against pathogens. And that's why we often find antiviral, antibacterial, and interestingly, antiparasitic um, compounds, some of which could end up being anti-cancer compounds as well. It's not necessarily what the organism is making them for, but their targets potentially have application as anti-cancer drugs. And I think if you want to find new antimicrobials, go and look in an environment where the organism that's going to make them needs them. And our, our benthic invertebrates need these compounds to protect themselves from diseases. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I think I just want to check one. That is all the questions there seem to be. Um, I want to thank you again for the wonderful presentation you did. Um, very comprehensive again, like always. Uh, I would like to thank everybody that joined us today for the seminar series. Uh, it's wonderful to see your name scroll past on the screen. Hopefully we can do this in person again soon. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.